It's time for member statements. The member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we have a responsibility to represent at-risk persons in our ridings, and that includes people who are socially or economically disadvantaged and are at risk of becoming victims of human trafficking. For that reason, we must support victim services agencies in Toronto. This government has distributed anti-human trafficking support funds, but these funds do not correlate with what's necessary to support victims in my riding. The victim services of Hastings, Prince Edward, Lennox and Addington offers 24-hour-a-day short-term crisis support. And in the past six months, victim services helped 13 victims of human trafficking leave the sex trade and pursue their education. When victim services applied for the anti-human trafficking support fund, they were denied, quote, based upon a comprehensive assessment formula. However, they were given $18,000 by the Attorney General for staffing this year. These victims require emergency and long-term services, which include intensive care management, housing, food, medical and counselling. This can't be quantified by $65.38 per victim, which is the current allotment in my riding. On the other hand, Victims in Kingston Frontenac receive $472.12 per victim. Why is the funding formula inconsistent? Does the government think victims in my constituency are worth less? My region does not have a human trafficking centre and lacks the resources to place victims in group homes. What's the alternative? That we punish the victims of human trafficking by placing them in offender housing? We can do better. We have to do better. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Speaker. There is hardly a day that goes by in my office on Hamilton Mountain when I don't hear from a woman who is made to feel absolutely powerless when faced with our court system. These women might be trying to get financial support from their estranged father of their children. They might be caught up in a custody dispute or trying to make their case before a judge when dealing with the Children's Aid Society. But the problem, Speaker, is they are invariably outgunned by the highly paid lawyers in the court setting. In the vast majority of cases, they can't afford a lawyer and they can't get legal aid. Their only option is to represent themselves. Then they find out just what an impossible task that is. Already distraught by their situation, in addition to the stress and the upheaval it has caused, they now have to juggle part-time jobs to be able to struggle to get their kids looked after. They've done their homework, but they're terrified of what comes ahead. The intimidating atmosphere of a courtroom, the adversarial nature of the setting, and the knowledge that they will be facing people who do this every day of their lives but they have no choice. In this situation, what, is, what hope is there for justice to be served? Precious little. And it happens in courtrooms all across Ontario every single day. Women and children pay the price, and it has to change. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Kingston and the Islands. Mr. Speaker, last night, hundreds of people gathered in Kingston's Market Square to say goodbye to a musician an activist whose words and actions have touched millions. Just over a year ago, 25,000 people gathered in that same square to watch the Tragically Hip's last concert on the big screen. It was a magical night, and one that united Canadians from coast to coast. The sorrow that has accompanied Gord's passing has been equally widespread, and although he was suffering from terminal brain cancer, he continued to champion the causes he believed in, and most significantly, truth and reconciliation. Because of that work, the Assembly of First Nations aptly gave him an honorary name that translates to man who walks among the stars. He is doing that now. Earlier this year, we laid a commemorative plaque in Kingston's Market Square to mark the Tragically Hip's historic concert. The plaque quotes one of their best love songs with the lyric, everyone was in it from miles around. And we were, indeed. Gord had a gift for connecting with people and for making everyone feel like we were a part of something greater than ourselves. To Gord, if you are looking down upon us right now, we know you will be pulled in a million directions in this very moment. Thank you. Thank you for enchanting the hearts and minds of millions. Our nation is culturally richer and deeper for Gord's talent, his selfless determination, 
and will to right wrongs and make this world a better place. Rest in peace. Thank you. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Whitby, Oshawa. Thank you, Speaker. And Whitby Town Council has approved a partnership with the Durham District School Board, which establishes a new community hub in Henry Street High School. And this hub, Speaker, will serve as a youth room providing activities for youth in South Whitby. Currently, there are two other youth rooms in Whitby, the McKinney Centre near the centre of the town and the Brooklyn Community Centre and Library near the northern boundary of my riding. These centers, Speaker, are part of Whitby's Recreation and Leisure Services Youth Strategy and offer several programs free of charge to youth aged 12 to 18. Programs like cooking classes, studying, physical activities, and arts and crafts. This new youth room, Speaker, at Henning Street High School is both cost-effective, provides youth in South Whitby easily accessible extracurricular activities to possibly promote their overall development and opportunity to succeed. I extend my congratulations to Whitby Town Council for their leadership once again in providing this uh, needed hub for youth in our community. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Further member statements, the member from Essex. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, it's harvest season in Essex County and all across Ontario. This is the time of year when many of our constituents are packing up the kids, heading off to local orchards for apple picking or the local pumpkin patch in search of the perfect jack-o'-lantern. Farms from Maidstone to Ruthven, from Stony Point to River Canard are busy harvesting and moving crops to market. The autumn marks the culmination of a year's worth of hard, hard work and investment and risk taken by thousands of farm families in Essex County and represents a vital piece to both the economic and cultural underpinning of what I know to be the greatest place on earth to live, work, and to raise a family. How important is Essex agriculture locally uh, for our province, Speaker? Well, Essex County farms generate $1.2 billion in GDP each year. They top southwestern Ontario when it comes to employment, with 18,487 full-time equivalents in the sector. And Essex also raises the largest tax revenue for all, from all three levels of government, a total of $369 million each year when compared to other sub-regions of the southwest. While these numbers, Speaker, represent the success of more than a century of farming tradition, they also represent an opportunity for the future. The sector is literally growing, and Essex is leading the way. On behalf of Ontario New Democrats, I want to extend my sincere thanks to all of Ontario's farm families and wish them a safe and successful harvest, and that you find the time to celebrate your, yourselves, your accomplishments, your efforts, your hard work with friends, family, and loved ones once this very busy time of year has passed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On October 10, 2017, uh, International Mental Health Day was posted. I had the privilege of attending the first mental health forum in the riding of Ajax that day. Uh, the event was organized by Carry On Fenn and uh, the Carry On Fenn Foundation in partnership with the Ajax Library. Uh, they are in the East Gallery today. The president of Carry On Fenn is uh, Carry On. And of course, it was my pleasure to introduce her this morning uh, while they are visiting Queen's Park. She is with her uh, Rogers TV producer, Olga Lambert. And the forum in Ajax provided an opportunity for open and honest discussion about mental health with 16 mental health related organizations in attendance. And additionally, a, pair, a panel of experts of mental health, including health leaders from Lake Ridge Health and Ontario Shores were present to answer questions, as were some of us uh, elected people, my colleague across the floor and myself. Um, however, our friend Whitby MP Selena Cesar Chavanes was one of six speakers of the event, and I have to tell you, she knows depression firsthand and was courageous enough to go public with her struggles. 20% of Canadians will personally experience a mental illness, illness in their lifetime, and mental illness affects people of all ages, education and income and culture, while also impacting their families, friends and neighbours. And a new TV show is about to hit, with Durham Health 180 on Rogers TV, hosted by my constituent, Carrie Ann Fenning. She will provide a climate for people to discuss mental health issues as well as other issues throughout. And, uh, I appreciate the time, Mr. Speaker, and I, my watch is right in, in line with yours, sir. You're now 10 Thank seconds you. over. 
Further member statements? The member from Dufferin Caledon. Thank you, Speaker. This weekend, there's a great event happening at the Alton Mills Arts Centre, the eighth annual Empty Bowls. Empty Bowls actually began in Michigan in 1990. First, you choose your favourite locally crafted pottery bowl, and then you fill it with delicious soup from local restaurants. In the end, the proceeds go to the Orangeville Food Bank, the Exchange at Caledon Community Services, and the Cupboard in Orangeville. Local potter Ann Randoran started Empty Bowls in 2010, and it has become a popular annual event. Empty, Empty Bowls was recognized in 2016 with the Tourism Partnership Award from Headwaters Tourism. The fundraiser engages artists, restaurants, and volunteer servers from across Dufferin Caledon. Local artists donate the bowls, and local chefs donate their delicious soup. Empty Bowls is happening this Saturday, Sunday, October 22nd, at the Alton Mill, and will be supported by Ray's Third Generation Bakery, Lavender Blue Catering, Landman Garden and Bakery, Gourmandissimo Catering and Fine Foods, and Friends Chef Adventures, Inc. I hope to see you in Alton on Sunday to support Empty Bowls. Thank you. Thank you. The member statements. The member from Beaches is short. Well, thank you, Speaker. I'm delighted to rise today to talk about one of my favourite subject matters, craft beer. Now, you know, many years ago, almost 40 years ago, I helped establish craft beer rules in Ontario with the Campaign for Real Ale, and today I get to rise and celebrate Muddy York Brewing Company, a true local business success, success story in Beaches, East York. Um, until recently, Speaker, the only craft brewer I had in my riding. So Jeff and Susan Nicolek Began began brewing while Jeff was still running his dye shop in East York, Skilled Craft Steel Rule Dyes. In 2013, Jeff began brewing in a three hectoliter system and selling to local bars and restaurants, such as the Relish, which is on the Danforth near Woodbine. And after obtaining a retail license and a few successful pop-ups, they could sell, now sell bottles to the public and they expanded to 10 hectoliters. Buying more fermenters over the course of 2015-17, Muddy York has now increased production over 800%, and they've now opened a retail bottle shop full-time, and this is when Susan was able to focus on the brewery in a full-time basis. Susan's background is in design and art, and she designs all the labels, artwork, and marketing social media for sales. And both Jeff and Susan began working in a tap room, which was just set up this year, and I went to the opening uh, just a couple of weeks ago, and it was unbelievably fantastic. So Jeff is now able to sell the dye shop. In fact, he's taken over the dye shop, moved all the production of beer into what once was a very successful metal banging shop, and he's now 100% in the beer industry, doing 50 hectoliter batches at and, and now he's starting to sell the LCBO. So I want to congratulate Jeff and Susan for what they're doing, promoting great craft beer in Ontario, Beaches East York. Cheers. Thank you. <laughs> Further statements, the member from Oxford. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, this week is Waste Reduction Week. My riding of Oxford is a leader in waste reduction. When I was mayor in southwest Oxford, we created the first mandatory recycling program in Ontario. In 2015, Oxford County Council passed a motion to establish Oxford as a zero-waste community, which includes developing strategies to reduce solid waste generation and divert as much waste from landfills as possible. Mr. Speaker, this issue is particularly important in my riding where residents are continuing to fight a proposed landfill site in Beachville. If development if developed, this landfill would pose a threat to the town of Ingersoll's drinking water and the Thames River. I've raised these concerns about the landfill proposal many times in this legislature, and I want to continue to push the Minister of Environment and Climate Change to block this proposal. As part of the Waste Reduction Week, I also encourage the Minister to look at ways to improve our ability to recycle materials and encourage reuse of materials to keep them out of landfills for as long as possible. I also encourage businesses and individuals to look at ways to reduce the amount of waste they create. When we reduce, reuse, recycle, we can help keep our communities clean and healthy and reduce our dependence on landfill sites. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present this petition. Thank you. I thank all members for their statements. It's their